Welcome to Art for Justice, Emory Douglas and the Black Panther Party. Thanks for registering and thank you for attending. We'll be starting shortly. We'll put information in the chat on how you can support ongoing equity programs and speakers at the College of Marin and the work of the Emoja Equity Institute. This program is being sponsored by the Emoja Equity Institute, the Communications Department, and the Fine Arts and Architecture Department. My name is Professor Walter Turner, and I'm the chairperson of the Social Science Department and the coordinator of the Emoja Equity Institute. The Emoja Equity Institute is committed to building equity throughout the College of Marin and the College of Marin community. We provide programs in mental health, faculty development, classified staff development, and support for high school students towards graduation and college attendance. None of this would be possible without the support of the staff and students at the College of Marin. I extend our thanks to President Superintendent Dr. David Wayne Kuhn, Vice President Jonathan Eldridge, and the College of Marin Board of Trustees. Today's program agenda will include introductions from our campus co-sponsors, the presentation by Emory Douglas, and we will allow 25 to 30 minutes for questions, which can be placed in the chat. At this time, I would like to introduce Dr. Kevin Muller, the chairperson of the Fine Arts and Architecture Department. Thank you, Walter. Um, on behalf of the students, uh, faculty and staff of the Fine Arts and Architecture Department, I wanna express our excitement and uh, enthusiasm for this upcoming talk by Emory Douglas. Um, it's a really special occasion to have him here to share his uh, art and his life experience with us. Um, I wanna thank Professor Walter Turner, as well as um, all those involved in the Umoja program here at the College of Marin for all the hard work that they've put together, put forth in order to put this program on uh, successfully. I'd like to also thank Professor Colleen Myhall. Uh, for her efforts uh, on behalf of the project as well. And finally, I'd like to thank Emory Douglas himself. Um, I'd like to express our gratitude for him spending the time to share with us his experiences as well as his wisdom about how art can function in the context of both the public sphere, shaping minds and also social justice. Back to you, Walter. At this time, I'd like to introduce Dr. Colleen Myhall of the Communications, Communications Department. Thank you, Pro Professor Turner. As he said, my name is Colleen Myhall. I teach in the Communications Department at the College of Marin. Um, on behalf of the Communications Department, I wanted to thank uh, Dr. Kevin Muller, the Fine Art and Architecture Department, and the Emoja Equity Institute. Um, Emery Davis, we are deeply honored um, that you've taken the time to share your art and social justice work with our students and our community. Um, as many of you know, Emery Douglas's um, artwork was a prominent feature on the pages and cover of the Black Panther newspaper. Radical independent media are critical to movements, creating an expressive space for activists to articulate um, their demands in their own words in their own terms. Um, they need to create and the need to create and produce high quality context driven journalism within and outside the corporate commercial media landscape is as crucial now as it's ever been. Um, if your major is art, biology, astronomy, psychology, nursing, world languages, communication, or if you're undecided, or you, you're not even a student at the College of Marin yet, we need you, journalism and media production is for you. Our world desperately needs scientists who can write research informed articles about climate change for a general public. We need sociologists and historians who can add much needed context to public understandings of social problems and global politics. We need more women and people of color and media and news production period. Um, I encourage you to check out our course offerings in communication, in journalism, and in film, television, and electronic media. I hope to see you in class. Again, thanks to the co-sponsors, thanks to Emory Douglas, and back to you, Walter. Art for Justice, Emory Douglas and the Black Panther Party. 
few artists have had a greater revolutionary visual impact on 20th century Black politics, art, and graphic design than Emory Douglas. Emory Douglas was born in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and has resided in San Francisco Bay Area since 1951. He attended City College in San Francisco, where he majored in commercial art. In 1967, Emory Douglas became the Minister of Culture of the Black Panther Party. Emory Douglas's artwork and design concepts graced the front and back pages of the Black Panther newspaper and highlighted the values of the party's 10-point programs and platforms. Emory's artwork accented the party's commitment to self-defense for the Black community and the various survival programs of education, housing, health, and human rights. At the height, the Black Panther newspaper sold more than 400,000 copies a week. Emory Douglas knew and worked with the key leaders and founders of the Black Panther Party, Eldridge Cleaver, Bobby Seale, Kathleen Cleaver, Bobby Hutton, Tarika Lewis, Big Man, and thousands of young men and women throughout the country who viewed the movements of Black power as central to Black liberation, Black self-determination, and human rights. Emory Douglas has exhibited and presented throughout the world, the United States, Lebanon, Australia, England, Portugal, the Netherlands, Scotland, Argentina, Mexico, Colombia, Cuba, Canada, Brazil, Spain, to name a few. For many years, Emory Douglas was a layout and graphic design artist for the San Francisco Sun Reporter, a San Francisco newspaper dedicated to the African-American community. In 2015, Emory Douglas was awarded a medal from the American Institute of Graphic Design in recognition of his contributions to the field of graphic design and visual communications. In 2019, Emory Douglas was awarded an honorary doctorate degree in fine arts from San Francisco Art Institute. Please welcome Dr. Emory Douglas to the College of Moran. Here is again a, show, a take off of the battle that took place. This is at Cornell University. I asked your photograph when they were demanding Black ethnic studies, Black studies and threats came on their lives, so they had to get protection while they were in there protesting for, many, for a week or so and, and to defend themselves against the attacks that were coming and they, that were real, that they were getting feedback about. So this is what this art was a reflection of. 1972, the Olympics, you, then you had uh, Wayne Mac, Vincent Matthews, and, and Wayne Collette, who ignored tradition at Munich Olympics. When they won the, the, the 1968 protests and demonstration was continuing. When they won the Olympics and stood on the podium, they stood there at ease. That's why this was called at ease. They didn't cry crocodile tears. They put their hands over their heart. They just stood there at ease. That was the inspired worship for this image here. And this is the spirit that Kaepernick came out. This is it here. Here again, showing our solidarity with these young brother, La Sieta de la Raza, Latino brothers, who were charged with the murder of San Francisco police, could not get any help from anywhere. So we got them a lawyer, and we helped them develop their newspaper, uh, Bastia, and eventually they were found not guilty. Because can you imagine if they wouldn't have this kind of support, they would have been in the gas chamber or still in prison today. So uh, there's more context to it, but we can talk about it later. We also boycotted lettuce. We supported the United Farm Workers getting, getting uh, unionized, as well as getting contracts in, with, in, the, in Safeway stores back then. This is when Caesar Chavez was marching to Sacramento to protest against the uh, chemicals that were harming the farm workers working in the fields. And this image I did to show our solidarity with that during that time. Here again is one that said, whatever is good for the person has got to be bad for us. It says, hey, have no slaves for care. We're gonna need them for Mars, Pluto, and all those other planets. That's the pig up on the pig deck. And when he taking them out onto, onto the planet, it says the uh, you have the, the slaves said, hey, I knew we should have stopped this shit before it got off the ground. Then you had the pig over here with the shovel and the pick 
saying, okay, God damn it, don't take 400 years this time. To the right, we want an end to the robbery by the capitalists of our black community. We want to oppose to the Christmas holiday. We oppose to the, the exploitation of the holiday itself. And I just uh, remixed it a little bit by putting it in the context of the times that we are now with the COVID situation. We want decent housing fix for the shelter of human beings. This is to bring attention to that. Then that was one of the points of the 10 point platform program of the Black Panther Party. So I was bringing attention to that with this one. And also with this one here, also the conditions, freedom psychologically, the conditions that one may live in. Hypertension kills, I'm hungry, I'm unemployed, I'm black. Here's conditions fighting off the rats, spending more time fighting off the rats to take care of the children, gives me, me, gives me a right to, to kill the greedy slumlord. Today's situation, anywhere in America, all over the world, this is what the reality is. Listen to them pigs banging on my door, asking me for some rent money. They should be paying my rent. Justice. To the right, my blood is old, but you have made it stronger. You are hope, our future, our life, my child. This is going back to a historical one. We are soldiers in the army. We have to fight, although we have to die. We have to hold up the bloodstained banner. We have to hold it up until we die. My mother was a soldier. She had her hand a freedom plow. And when she got old and couldn't fight them all, she said, we're going to get up and fight anyhow. Her father was a soldier. He had in his hand a freedom plow. And when he got old and couldn't fight, he said, we're going to get up and fight anyhow. Now, we're all the soldiers we have in a hand a freedom plow. When we get old and can't fight anymore, we got to get up and fight anyhow. I just want to testify, I'm not going to sit around any longer. We shall fight, we shall survive without a doubt. This is for voter registration back in the day, did the artwork here. Nothing from nothing leaves nothing, you got to do something, register to vote. To the right, vote for survival free food programs, free shoe programs, free health clinics. These were the things that we were putting forth. That's the language that you're hearing today is that language came from and that idea of implementing those kinds of social justice needs from the Black Panther era of the Black Panther Party. It is my belief that we Black people need gas and electricity on cold and dark days. Doctors and medicine in times of sickness, breakfast, lunch, and dinner in times of hunger. Next to that, all power to the people, the many, some of the many social programs that we had, the free breakfast, the free health clinics, all these things we had during that time, all power to the people. We had senior citizen programs, safe, seniors are called safe, seniors against the fearful environment. Oakland at one time wanted to spend $54,000 on a helicopter to control the community against crime. We say, well, if you really want to stop crime, you take the $54,000 and you invest it into the young people to take the senior shopping, to pick them up from the satellite house, to take them to get their groceries and, and you cast your checks. That's the way you cut crime, not by a helicopter moving over the community, and nothing investment in, in the community. To your right is Homecoming. This is Sonia Sanchez's first poetry book. Uh, I, she asked me to do the artwork for the book, and which I did and was honored to do. We also did over 100,000, we call it a sickle cell anemia disease that predominantly impacts the African American community in this country. We did over 100,000 free testing of sickle cell anemia during, back during that day and made people more well aware of it. The people in the party who took the test found out that why they were ill all their life after they took the test themselves. Here's several of my, of my beautiful posters that was done by the Cuban artists of my work. A lot of people thought I was copying the Cuban art when they seen this poster who were going back and forth. But to your right is the images that they remixed of mine to make this amazing poster, Ospal, Organization of Alistair, uh, Os Ospal, Organization of African, Latin America. It's, it's also an organization of people from Africa, Asia, and Latin America. 
Here again is another one they did of my work, 1968, in four different languages, Solidarity with the African American People, August 19, 1968, in four different languages. This was a little art within the interior of our paper. So after that, we knew that they, diff, they, they were reading the paper as well. There's Rex Nixon, who wanted to be King Nixon, corporate profit, defense spending, all that was going up, consumer buying going down, same thing today. Here again, Richard Nixon and Spiral Agnew uh, on Halloween said trick or treat, pigs trick or treat. And uh, you have to, both of them had to leave office in disgrace. Richard Spiral Agnew was a criminal vice president, got caught in corruption, had to leave. Richard Nixon was going to be in peace and left criminal running the government. This one to the right, I'll say, I, George Ford, I, Gerald Ford, am the 38th puppet of the United States. Corporate America still runs this government. That's why we're in all these wars. It's about controlling the natural resources of, of country. That's why we got all this mass destruction and killing and murdering of sovereign people all in Africa and Asia. And here to the left is the little U.S. peerless nurse knowledge, Lib Piglet. Who, uh, uh, or, who have colonized or directly, indirectly in the world at some point. And you got Ger West Germany, Israel, you got South Africa being Rhodesia, Japan, Greece, France, to name a few. Here is another one. My suffering, my bitterness, my loneliness, I'm not going to let it get me down. I'm not going to let it turn me around. Maybe the young brother has family member who's incarcerated. Why, why must black people look at each other through prison bars? Where is our freedom? Where the brothers and sisters who are incarcerated are in maximum security. We who are family members and loved ones are in minimum security, locked in that whole situation with them. Cost of surviving is criminal. Event in two black men's lives. Prison Camps USA, we call it the Prison Industrial Complex today. Uh, this is conspiracy to destroy the Black Panther Party, Cointelpro, counterintelligence program. As you've seen the, the, uh, the film that came out uh, uh, based on Chicago chapter of the Black Panther Party. Cointelpro owed $20, $30 million to destroy and discredit the Black Panther Party by any means necessary. Bobby Seale, Huey Newton, political prisoners, USA. We still have many political prisoners that we're working on at this time to hopefully to get out as out of prison at some point. Some have been successfully liberated through the courts, through the legal system to get out of prison. And we're hoping to continue that in the near future. Through the New York 21, Panthers who were charged with over 107 charges, uh, eventually dropped and all just missed, set up, trumped up Cointelpro. Here again, you can kill a revolution, you can, you can murder a revolutionary, but you can't murder a revolution. This is about the Chicago Panthers. This is Mark Clark and Fred Hampton. Here again, is this is Chicago. These are Panthers who were martyred in, in, in Chicago. Free Angela, she was a close comrade of the Black Panther Party. She introduced us to George Jackson. And all of us, matter of fact, through her love, the love letters, but personally is when we got in contact with George, it was through Angela. And he uh, wanted to start the uh, first chapter of the Black Panther Party in prison. And it was started in San Quentin prison. Bobby Seale, when he was in Chicago, did the speech uh, at the Democratic Convention, came back and he was arrested. We call that sna snatched off the streets, call it kidnapped, this paper. When he went back to trial in the court, he was gagged and chained in the court, not given the right to, to uh, defend himself when the lawyer was ill. Therefore, I call this a black man has no right that a white racist political judicial system is bound to respect. He went on to New Haven, 
again, when I mentioned earlier that he and Erica Huggins were both set up for the, uh, by the agent provocateur for the murder of Comrade in New Haven, which you're eventually found not guilty of. And they were really out, it says it will be the people and only the people who will wrest control of the lives of Chairman Bobby Seale and Erica Huggins out of the hands of the fascist American government. And this is the image of the victory image. It says, hallelujah, the might and the power of the people is beginning to show. This is when Bobby and Erica were exonerated and cut free in New Haven, Connecticut. Afro-American solidarity with the oppressed people of the world. We're always in solidarity with the original caretakers of this land. We had a close relationship with AIM, the American Indian Movement, who acknowledged that they were inspired by the Black Panther Party back in the day. And they were always our comrades. Here I'm going into the remix images now. Uh, uh, this is a remix of the Panther image that you're seeing, my more recent remix. This is one I, um, Brother Malcolm called uh, uh, Brother Malcolm the Warrior. These are uh, Brother Malcolm, the father figure of Dr. King. Dr. King, who said, the United States was a greater purveyor of violence on the planet. Here again is using several of my images, remix images of people in the community who used to come and get their paper every week. This brother, he would be slushed, but he would come get his paper. This sister, she would sit out in the back of our headquarters because she lived back there, and she'd get her paper and read it every week. And so I, 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 want to, I did this um, image of them to honor them. And this is a remix of the image I did. And, I, you know, and, but I have it dealing with all power to the people, global warming, housing, jobs, all those things as the text in the images, as you will see when you can see them large. And also, she, her paper says today's news. And it says, just resist unjust laws, SOS, global warming, respect Mother Earth. Don't support the greedy. Here we are living in the land of plenty while we the people starve, the people's free food program. Our mothers and our fathers and family members were sharecroppers, worked the same in them same fields here in California that you have the sharecroppers working today. Educate to liberate freedom. Turtle Island, North America, indigenous territory. All this is indigenous territory. Health is wealth. I like the saying, yes, non toxic. I'm food insecure, the button says. I'm homeless, this button says. Survival pending revolution, people's free health clinics, people's free breakfast programs. We had a free ambulance service in Winston Salem. Ambulance wouldn't come into the service in the community or in an orderly time or at all. So the Panthers wouldn't got certified as ambulance drivers, and the community helped them buy an ambulance. So in Winston Salem, the first chapter in the South, we had an ambulance, free ambulance service. We had a free bus into prison program. In Chicago, they had a bus like this, like a Greyhound bus that was given to them. But we had cars and vans, whatever it would. Certain location folks could come to every weekend and could get a free ride to go see their loved ones who were incarcerated in those prisons. We had people's free clothing program. We had the people's free, free uh, shoe program. Many, many more, the people's free health clinics. Father's love. Mother's love. African-American solidarity with the Asian community. Freedom. This is an image that I've done at an exhibition that Greg Morizumi had put together many years ago for reparations as it related to the African-American community and the Japanese-American demand for, for reparations. Here's Image ideas using spelling the reparation using the figures as the word would change red, white, and blue. 
and use this adinkra symbol. It, uh, you are a slave of him whose handcuffs you wear. And it, it's about justice. Here again is one of our, it's a historical one. One of the first images I did, this was a wash drawing I did, painting of a little kid playing with the toy gun with the rubber bullet bumpers that they stick on it, pushing in, they plan hit the target and what have you. Yeah. This was a remix as you've seen earlier. Our struggle continues from one generation to the next. Here's what with madness we in in a different way, but we're still in it until proven different. And this is no matter which way this guy returned, he was a liar, distorted, deceptive, dishonest, fascist, xenophobe, white only, in, talking about the immigration, ice cold wickedness, separation of families, babies from mothers and what have you, all that and from fathers, mommy, mama, papa, poppy, made in the USA. Culture strike, when I went to, uh, uh, went to uh, Arizona to observe what was going on in relationship to immigration. This is over five or six years ago. I was invited by culture strike and we had to do art around it. And I was invited by Fabiana Rodriguez. And Arizona then was the state that was the leading one in this whole repressive situation dealing with the, the Im immigration situation where the folks who were, the work document couldn't get jobs, couldn't go to school, couldn't work, all those couldn't work, couldn't get health care, none of that. So that's what that Senate bill SB 1070 was about. Justice resists unjust laws. Amendment one to the Constitution of the United States of America freedom of religion, speech, and the press, right of assembly and petition, boycott BDS, boycott divest sanction, down with apartheid. Peace heal, war kill. These are both posters I've done for one was for Spike Lee's film, The Five Bloods, that I was asked to do uh, for online uh, PR that I work with on. This is the one I did for Judas, and the Black Messiah uh, that they want to remix with their brother Kalugu, uh, Kaluga, as in the, as the uh, as in the, as opposed to Fred Hampton in the artwork itself. Uh, so this was also for online uh, uh, discussions and about the the art, about the uh, my work and my history, and, and some some young folks, as well as was used for PR purposes online. This is war, W-A-R, abstract images. This here is a Bantu symbol, symbol, abstract of it, of that interpretation of it. And that, that when it's coming at you this way, that means war. But if they were going the same way, that would mean harmony and peace. This is what the product of war does to human beings, the psychological impact of war, uh, the impact. You got hundreds of thousands of people all over the world, stepping on landmines right now. Mother Earth, this is the doomsday clock that they talk about. We're getting closer and closer with no return. Glacier, a melting glacier. All of oh, the Earth heating up. All these things, toxic. Global warming global warming. I just remixed it again because I want to put it in the context of how this is a part of the global warming. This COVID. This is when those US, U.S. soldiers feasted in the water in Haiti and called the cholera epidemic. With over 10,000, 100,000 people died and hundreds of thousands were ill and sick. And the UN were refusing to acknowledge that the UN was the cause, the soldiers were the cause of it. But eventually they come to acknowledge that to some degree. Respect Mother Earth. 
I also have one that says Black Lives Matter, but this one says Respect Mother Earth. Then again, is Playtime. On here, on the little thing, it says Global Warming. This is a new remix I'm doing of the one we should survive without a doubt. Black Lives Matter, Justice Now, Black Lives Matter. As much as things change, some things stay the same. Why did you get to both brutalize and murder us and we get to blame? Police Terror, USA. This was the first one I did of that when Oscar Grant was murdered on the BART. And they had the BART insignia right there. The, the Black Code. This is a black person has no rights, which a, a, a institutional racist judicial system is bound to respect. It gives the appearance of being fair and just when the biased decisions have already been decided. This is a, a, a collaboration with Aboriginal artist named Richard Bell in, in Australia because they wanted to do this, wanted, his gallery wanted us to do this one with Peter Norman because as I mentioned, he was the one who ran the race with them and supported them in solidarity. But young people in Australia weren't aware of that history. And so they asked us to do this, this here because he ran for the fastest time to qualify for the 1972 Olympics in Munich. But they blacklisted him. He was never allowed to run again because he supported John Carlos and Tommy Smith at the 1968 Olympics. The Teletelecoco, excuse my Ebonics, that's the way I spell it, massacre that took place October 2nd, 1968. This was that pre-Olympics, just before the Olympics. You had these students and activists who were slaughtered, wiped off. They say it was, they try to say it was about 60, but people say it was three or 400 or more. And you had the Pentagon was involved with this directly or indirectly because the big guy sent radios, radio weapons, ammunition, and riot control training material to Mexico before and during the massacre. This is me in Chiapas being introduced to the Zapatistas at this store where we're going to come back and paint it in about a year or so. Later, this is when we came back, but a, a collective about 14, 15 artists together, and it was about solidarity, health, education. Those were the elements that they wanted the visual to be a part of the uh, the the uh, installation, the images. Here were my contributions. They like the humor kind of stuff too, so I did the snail. They call it snail. They, you know, solidarity, salute, education, production, culture. The people of the corn, yeah. and they wear the mask. They say when we didn't wear the mask, then people didn't notice us. But now we wear them. Everybody wants to know who, who we are and what we're about. These are the dials that are part of the installation that are up on the uh, air, up on top of the uh, the uh, as you can see here, right here. These are images of my work reinterpreted by the Zapatista Mayan Women Collective. These are embroideries. Uh, it's a, there was a couple of more, but these are what we have available that are here to show. And it's uh, based on Zapatero Negra. That was the project, Zap, that's the play of Zapatista, uh, uh, Zapatista Panthers. And it was a whole movement that started around that of young people, music, artwork, called Zapatero Negro. Booklets then came out about it as well. This is an uh, urban in Manchester, England. I had over 45,000 people who came to this exhibit from October of 2000, uh, 2008 to, uh, to around April 2009. Had desks where books and write reading material connected to the desk that people could come into the exhibition and read what we were reading, required reading as well. This was opening night of the exhibition. This is, our, this is in, now this is in, this is in uh, Aust New Zealand at Elam International School of Fine Arts where I was invited for my first journey to New Zealand. These are on the streets up by the university itself. There was so much interest in my coming 
that they had to cancel the artist in residency and then travel the North and South Island with artists and other creative folks talking about the history behind the artwork for 41 days. This is when I met with some Samoan students while I was there, artists, all amazing artists. Uh, had, when I went into the class, they had pictures of Tupac, Coltrane, all kinds of amazing artwork that they themselves had done. This is in, uh, this is in the talk with some of the young Maori in New Zealand, in Auckland, where they're planning an action against some land grab there, and they wanted to get my suggestions and idea input. This is in, in 19, 2009 in Urbis in Manchester, England, did a, pre, a master class with these young people whose art was also included in the exhibit that you're seeing where I talked about the 43,000 people coming. This is Arge, Argentina, Trimarchi. I've invited some young people to be a part of this at a big uh, uh, international basketball stadium and, and doing my presentation. And you had two big screens, that's the interpreter. This is after on the other side of the uh, auditorium. Amazing. Skateboarding outside, young artists in the quarters are showing their artwork, music, workshops for a whole weekend. People from Brazil, Paraguay, all around Colombia, everywhere uh, were there. 99% just young people. This is Portugal. This is uh, in, in, in Lisbon, Lisbon. And as you go up, you'll see images on the wall of the work and, 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 as you, and four, four floors of artwork and paintings on the wall. Now, this one is in Nottingham, contemporary in Nottingham, UK. I was there to do a, a presentation in conjunction with Jean Genet, the French artist, who, the French writer who supported the Black Panther Party back in the day. This is in Bogota, Colombia, when I was invited there had a, at the Banco de Republica to have an exhibition. This is on the streets of Bogota. As you go up and down, you will see these images going up and going down, announcing it. This is in uh, this is in uh, this is in Brazil. This is in uh, uh, when I was in uh, San Paulo, Brazil, San Paulo, Brazil. And the, uh, this is on the outside. They had a big, a big crane in, I seen it to put this up. And this is at a place called, I think it's called Sessi. And they had elevators, they had tents. Everywhere you walked, you had elevators where they had put the, the, the graphics on the elevators as you went in. This is getting preparations for the evening, as you can see. This is opening night. Yeah, a lot of young people who came from the favelas as well. Uh, to uh, during, during the time that I was there. This is in Oakland. This is Artists in Solidarity with Palestine. And these are all just the 10, it was nine different artists. You had Susan Green, which is a uh, Jewish American artist. You had African American artist, Afrocentric American artist, uh, uh, Afro futurist American artist. And then you also had Japanese American, you had Arab American, you had myself, you had these indigenous artists. You had uh, also another indigenous artist. Then you also had the uh, artist from Jordan. But Susan Green was on the far right, was working on the artwork from the sister from Palestine who was not able to get, uh, ex was not able to allow to leave. So she, they, she had to reinterpret it from her uh, photograph. Me are standing with some of the kids from Palestine in front of the completion. This is in Arusha, Tanzania, when I was there. And they like there's this image here. They wanted to in integrate that into the spirit of what they were creating, the, the free spirit of what was being created by these young young artists. And these are youngsters from different tribes. Some of them are my side, from other different tribes, but they're coming together in unity, in respect. They're not they're not off into the tribalism in the context of division and separation, but into harmony and unity. And there are a lot of I'm a hip hop artist and they love Mama Sia. Endangered species. That's what these youngsters don't realize they're coming to. They don't realize mental bondage, talking bullets, speaking bullets, less than 1%. That's the image here I did with these youngsters. Again, when I went to New Zealand, 
I was asked to do with these young people who were in this program to come and work on art. And they liked, uh, they wanted to do something from my artwork that I did, the one that I just showed you, this one here, kind of based on that one, but based on the fact of how they greet each other with the mo, with the, this is the honey, honey they call it, nose to nose, forehead to forehead. And they used to have, they called tattoo here, they call it, mostly they call them mochas over there, but the students call them tattoos, but mocha is a traditional name. But they wanted one to have peace in it. So they kind of designed it. And this is in a shop. This now, this old image is about eight feet by eight feet. It is at a strip mall uh, in, in South Auckland. That's where you got a lot of gang banging. That's where you got a lot of on that part of the area. You never have anything out in that area. But they but after go, being there for the uh, the International Art Festival a couple of years before that, and they seen the kind of uh, response that we were getting from the exhibition stuff that we did then and the write-ups that came up of saying that was the best of the whole international festival. Then they began to want to push stuff out in that area. So that's when they called me, I had to just ask what I contribute to uh, working with the young people, which I did. Here you again, you see the honey where I talk about this is Tommy E.T. When I first time I went to Australia, New Zealand, I was in, uh, met and took it to the uh, Marae and given my official weapon to the land by them in the Polynesian Panthers. If you didn't know, there were official chapters of the Polynesian Panthers in New Zealand who became official chapter in 1971. Here's these youngsters don't realize today that they're getting themselves into modern day slavery by marketing, by money, prison industrial complex, private property, free political prisoners now, justice now, free political prisoners, freedom fighters, USA, fighters for peace, justice, freedom, particularly the struggle against recognized cruel and oppressive conditions, governments, inhumane policies and actions. Here are symbols of political prisoner, Mamiya Abu-Jamal, who is just had a heart pat sur surgery, had hepatitis C. Leonard Peltier, who still lingers in prison with many alien problems from health problems. Both innocent, both need to be free. That brings to other political prisoners that we're also trying to get out at this time. You can look online to Jericho and, and many other political prison sites to see what being taken place or you can talk to people who know about political prisoners to give you some more insight about Russell Maloon and Suntiata and others. Here again is the remix, as I mentioned, the Sister Hallelujah with the, with the justice combination. And this one says, dare to struggle, dare to win. This is at the Lorraine Hansberry Museum. This is the, where Dr. King was assassinated in 1968, it's now a museum, and they wanted to have a permanent exhibit of Black Panther Party as part of their Black Power exhibition. And they remixed this artwork of All Power to the People to be in a part of that uh, installation that's a permanent installation in Chattanooga, Tennessee, I believe. And this is the last one called All Power to the People. This is a remix of the paper board. This is a more recent one with the paper girl. And I want to thank you all and thank you, all power to the people. So we want to open up and uh, I know you can, we can't open up your mics here, but you can give uh, uh, Emory Douglas a round of, uh, round of applause. Uh, as we mentioned in the beginning, uh, he, um, Minister of Revolution, Minister of Culture for the Black Panther Party, uh, has traveled around the world and uh, exhibited uh, everywhere and dealt with issues of social justice for his life. We have a few questions. And so what you can do, a couple of things, giving you advice here. If you want more information about the Emoja Equity Institute and the work that we're doing here at the College of Marin, uh, that will be in the chat and you can see that particular a link and you can sign up for information on future events. Um, if you go there, there's a way to uh, donate and support 
the ongoing efforts of building equity here at the College of Marin. We talked a bit about the Emoja Equity uh, Institute. Uh, you also can go to the, and let me see this here, uh, the Jericho Movement, which is one of the first questions someone wanted to ask. Um, Professor Douglas uh, was about the issue about aging uh, political prisoners. You can also go into the chat and put your uh, questions and we'll get in as uh, many as we can. Why don't I give uh, Emory two questions that I see right now in the, the chat. One was about, I saw it earlier, was about your experience of being a young man going up to uh, Sacramento uh, with the uh, with the members of the Black Panther Party who were challenging the new laws. And the second one was about the uh, notion of the uh, political prisoners that are aging that you're doing work around. And let me add off of that, if those people want to get information about political prisoners, there is a link uh, in the chat there on Jericho Movement Free Political Prisoners. So why don't we take them a couple at a time and Emory, you can you can go from there and we've got time. Okay, well, Sacramento, so put it in context, there was a meeting today that we were supposed to leave to go to Sacramento. Now, at that meeting, Huey and Bobby had discussed why one was going and the other was staying behind because they felt that it would be a, what we then call a colossal event, that their possibility to be pressed there, there was always a possibility that there could be arrest. So, and this being an infant organization, only six months into the, seven months into the organization itself, that uh, they need, one need to stay back to deal with the press and ask to respond to questions while the other one went. And it, uh, between, I guess, Bobby and them, it was decided that Bobby would go and he would stay back to deal with whatever came up. Now, when you see Sacramento and you see the delegation, you don't see any women, but there were men and women and nun pathers who were part of that delegation. There was a brother named Mark Comfort who had been organizing, who had been to the South and civil rights men, been to Lyons County, who also was the one who got Hugh and them in contact with the Dow family because he thought that the Panthers could help the Dow family when the young man who got murdered in North Richmond. He had a group of young men who also went to Sacramento. There was the Dow family. Some of their brothers and sisters were a part of that delegation. Bobby Seale's first wife, Artie Seale, was a part of that delegation. So this was a whole delegation. It was not going there for any gunplay. The guns were put into the trunk until we got to the state capitol. Once we got to capitol, that's when the guns were taken out legally to go into the capitol. But when we got on the lawn, it just so happens that out of luck, I guess, Ronald Reagan was there having a press conference about 10 feet away. And at that time, all the press came, well, he was there with some parochial kids and all the Zoom, everybody came over to where we were with the press, wanted to know why we were there. But also, Bobby was supposed to read an executive mandate number one as well. And what executive mandate number one dealt with was the concentration camps that they were building then to incarcerate black people and people of color. You call that the prison industrial complex today. It was there after that we went into the Capitol. We did not invade the Capitol. They opened the doors and let us into the Capitol with the press. The press didn't know what the changes was, what laws were being uh, discussed, nor did we. But we found it was on the second floor and we followed the, the newsmen. We get up on the second floor and go into the chambers. It's the press that goes in first. And it's the first press that they say, get the, get, the, uh, get the cameras out of here. We follow right behind them. They see us come in. They say, get the guns out of here. And everybody turn and leave. And we still, we go back out on the Capitol grounds for 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Everybody goes different ways, except for the cadre of us who are going back to Oakland. And we go to a filling station, a couple, two or three blocks away. And we in there getting, uh, getting gas and had the guns out, getting ready to put them back into the trunks. And this cop come by on this motorcycle we see all these black men with this gun. He gets on there, whoop, whoop, whoop. Next thing you know, they got helicopters and everybody swooping down on us. And we get arrested. 
in go to court, make a long story short. That was a colossal event because you had demands of people wanting back and forth, wanting to know how they could join the Black Panther Party. Okay. So we need to organize. So they, what happened is that going back and the lawyers, they had talked to the lawyers, said they didn't know everybody who had guns, but they wanted six or seven to 11 people to plead guilty to a non-supervised misdemeanor. I mean that you could plead guilty and you'd be cut loose. But they didn't know who all to, they wanted. They knew some, they knew Bobby Seale, Bobby, and a few others. But, but they didn't know all. So Bobby put us together and explained that. He said, I was one of those that he wanted to plead guilty. And so when we came back and we put, went into court and went for the judge and we pleaded guilty and turned around to walk out to court, they said, no, no, y'all going to jail. So they set us up. So we went to jail. So um, that. Now dealing with the uh, issue of political prison, this has been an ongoing thing. You know, you had Geronimo Chijaka Pratt, who did over 27 years before we ever get him out of prison. But you have had comrades who have passed away in prison over 52 years. You know, Chip Fitzgerald, who's a comrade from LA. And you have others who are ill in prison today. You know, uh, you got you got people who who are did some serious stuff who are out of prison, but these comrades are being uh, persecuted because of their politics, and that's what you have to understand. These are, this is politics. Emory, can you tell us something about? how your process has changed. You have a question here, how your process has changed over the year. What kind of media do you use to draw and color and execute your art? Mm -hmm. Well, I see uh, sometimes I, I, have, I play around with my ideas, with pen and ink, uh, sketches like that, something. And uh, then, I, then I, I only know how to use Photoshop over the years through the youngsters, uh, going back and forth, sharing ideas, ideas with me, how to use it, and it finally all came together. So I do, I, I do a lot of stuff in Photoshop. I play and I paint online, all that. I integrate some of those materials, prefabricated materials that I will use in the textures of my art and the historical images that look like patterns and what have you, that you can buy from the art store and integrate it, scan it, cut it into your art, and paste it into your art. Well, now you can scan those same kind of products into your, uh, on your computer and apply it to in, in Photoshop. So I, uh, I do a lot in that context, yeah. People have talked in the, in the chat here about the images of, of guns. I think you've emphasized always the notion of a survival program. So can you talk about both of those things, uh, the armed self-defense as well as the survival programs which you've talked about being primary? Yes, well, the black, that was a part of the uh, survival program back in the day. That was point number seven. We want an end, immediate end to police brutality and murder of black people. That's why the patrols came about in the self-defense. That's what this was about. This was not going out, attacking, shooting up no community, attacking the, uh, the, the White House, none of that. This was about the Black Panther Party defending the community and exercising their right in the con and, and within the Constitution. And when black people use the Constitution to put a gun, use the Constitution, then they want to change the laws because that's what that was about. The uh, village, and you talked, to, uh, you mentioned the name there, which some people may have heard, not heard before. Uh, you mentioned the name of Mama C um, yeah. and uh, Pete O'Neill. I think there's a film out on Pete O'Neill. Talk about the work that's going on in, uh, in Tanzania and your visit there, Emory. Yes, I've been to Tanzania about four or four. About, I've been there about four times uh, to visit Pete and Charlotte. And uh, Brother Pete is in exile, can't come back. Uh, been out of the country since 1969. But they've been doing some uh, beautiful, amazing work since they lived in Tanzania. They've been welcomed there. And they have uh, a compound and they have took children who were obviously has families who couldn't prepared to deal with them. It took them in, about 20 kids, sent them to school, 
the whole thing, lived down the compounds. But they also connected them, told them always to learn about their history. They weren't trying to westernize them or anything else. They were teaching them about their history. And so they lived, in, they lived in, the, in the collective, but they also, kids would go back and visit their families on weekends and what have you. Many of them have grown up. I mean, you go into town, they know Mama C and, and Pete in, in Tanzania. They, they highly love. I mean, everybody, you go into town, Brother Mama P, Brother Charlotte, and the one you're traveling with. Mama Charlotte got an art that she contributed or made work with that's on the main circle kiosk there with other well-known artists that's in the insulated in downtown. I mean, anytime the hip hop artists, the younger generation are doing things there, they always call Mama C to be a part of it as well. So there's great love and respect. Since you mentioned Mama C and you mentioned the, the youth and you talked a bit about the poster that you had there for the Black Lives Matter, talk a bit about the, the movement of youth, the Black Lives Matter, the people who've been in the street, how you've been able to connect the work that you do with the social justice, uh, defunding of the police work that they're doing. Well, well uh, one, I, I would say defunding of the police is just an extension of uh, community control of police and, and going in that direction and continue, uh, you know, in, 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 in what we were talking about, uh, poli community control of police. But uh, it was early on when the Black Lives Matter movement was having their national uh, uh, meeting, I believe it was in Cleveland at the time, Ohio, I believe it was. And, but I wasn't able to attend because I had to go to Houston because they were, Panthers were having a thing down there uh, in Houston. And so there were Black Lives Matter artists who were there who were trying to get in contact with me to have a discussion. Eventually that did happen and they were, they were located in Miami and uh, Dream Defenders. And they contacted me, uh, we finally contacted me. We had a long, about an hour and a half discussion online and they were asking me about my history and what I was about, what I was doing. And at the same time, they was asking me about some of the art. And I was telling them how I was inspired by the art that came out of Cuba, out of Pal uh, the Vietnam art resistance during that time in Palestine and what have you. And they were able to Google it right at the same time. And they were able to see stuff that they weren't even aware of, some of them. So that was the way we connected with the uh, with, with the uh, with those youngsters there, and then I was invited to Liberty City down there by them and others, with Sonia Sanchez and Last Poets and some others to do a program that they had a major program they had down there. Yeah, uh, well, not only that, the uh, I've been invited to many campuses all over the country now where you have young Black Lives Matter students, activists who are working, who have who, who have invited me to do presentation. And so that's been the our link is they uh, is they are, is a mutual camaraderie and respect uh, that takes place based on them hearing my lectures and then asking me to come or letting others know that I want even Detroit I went to Detroit for four or five days while I was there and uh, and went to the University of Michigan uh, various all over and any way I go. There's have been Black Lives Matter folks connect on the, on the campuses, teachers in Men Duluth, Minnesota. I was there. You know, you had a uh, sister who was a graphic designer wanted me to come, was connected with Black Lives Matter and, and a teacher. So I went and I spoke at the university. Yeah, did some talks, we were able to connect, have these informal discussions and what have you. As, as, a, as a young man, one of the uh, questions in the chat is, uh, how did you make contact? As I mentioned in the intro, you knew and worked with the founders of the Black Panther Party. How did you meet them and how did you become part of the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, Emory? Well, I, 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 uh, um, it was because of the, uh, the police murders and they had people trying to, young people trying to figure out how to deal with the as we're today uh, to confront that. 
and I got involved with the Black Arts Movement. And then from the Black Arts Movement, I got into, uh, well, I went to City College while I was involved with Black Arts, I was going to City College of San Francisco. And at City College of San Francisco, it was a brother named Roland Young when I first came there. He was a jazz musician. Right. But he was coordinating the Black Student Union, the Negro Student Union there. And he asked me to come and work with him as an artist in relationship to changing the name. And that was at the same time that the uh, Black Student Ethnic Studies was trying to start at San Francisco State with the BSU. And so at City, Col City College, I was doing that and we were able to successfully with a lot of pushback and to change the name. While there, I also was working with a group of brothers and who were also trying to figure out what to do off campus with some work, because I had been going out to San Francisco State off and on because that's where everything was happening, the culture. And so when I went out there, I met into Amiri Baraka while he was out there. And I already knew Sonia Sanchez, so that's how I did her her first pub. She asked me to do that, that the uh, the first the first um, art for her first cover of her book was because she was already out of San Francisco State and she was here when the Black Arts Movement was going on as well. And so when going out to the state, I met Hank Jones and many other comrades. And it was during that period while doing uh, basic simple props for Amiri Baraka's plays, community theater and what have you, that it was myself, Hank Jones, and a few others were trying to figure out what we could do. And during that time, Hank contacted me because he was doing other community activity, political activity, and told me that they wanted me to come to a meeting, that they were planning to bring Malcolm X's widow to the bear, and they wanted me to do the poster for it because of, they knew of my art and the Black Arts Movement and what happened. So when I went to the meeting, they explained that uh, what it was about and that there were some brothers that would come over to the next meeting who would let them know if they would do the security or not for that event. Now this group here, I, now I live with the Black Panther Party of Northern California. So that the symbolism had already began, you know, it, it was in many ways, in many forms. And so when they came over the next week, after I had agreed to do the artwork, when they came over the next week, there was Huey Newton and Bobby Seals, I think a little Bobby Hudson, and they agreed that they would do the security for the event. It was after that meeting that I asked them how I could get involved, because I knew that's what I wanted to be a part of. Once, as soon as they gave the spell and the whole bit, I knew that. And they didn't, Huey and them had a business card, and you, they gave me a business card. I didn't have a car then, so I called Huey and scheduled to go by his house. And that was the beginning of me going by his house, meeting with Huey. And then after I go by his house, he would take me out in the neighborhood, introduce me to folks he know. Then we go by Bobby's house. And that was my first introduction. That was, that was late January, early February of 1967, about three and a half months after the inception of the organization. Okay. Okay. Now, then the organizing was going out into the, the hood, into the streets, going to nightclubs, both ends on, on the, uh, on, on the uh, grassroots side, on the intellectual side, on, the, on where the, the, doc, the black judges and black lawyers hung out, on the one hand, on the hardcore, on the other end, in discussion and debating. That's what was always going on with you and Bobby on with all those different uh, elements during that time. Yeah. So you're not going to tell us the story about the, the dice thing, huh? Uh-huh. You're not going to tell us the story about the dice. The dice? When you were shooting dice, you're not going to oh, tell us. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, that was when I was 13 years of age. Okay. That was, when, that was, that was my first time being arrested as a youngster. And when I was at the Hamilton Playground in San Francisco, Hamilton Playground in San Francisco, if, it, if you know where it is, it, it used to be just a shack in the middle. It didn't have the buildings of that. Didn't even have none of that. But then it, when it first did build it up, 
it's the back side of the place where the swimming pool there was a fence that you could walk through from Gary to Post. And in between, that's where the guys used to shoot pool at. I mean, not excuse me, shoot pool, but used to shoot the dice. And I'm out there shooting dice with them. And they come in from both sides and we get arrested. And that's my first and shooting dice with those guys, trying to make playing quarters and dimes. It's a small game. <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. Okay. Somebody's asking Emory here. Uh, everybody's asking about how do you get copies of your art? How do they get in contact with you? How do they get you into their school? Well, you give them my email. Uh, and it's, if they see it online or what they see, I don't mark it because I have been traveling. Okay, I I'll, print, I'll, put, I I'll, I'll put your email up there. I'll put your email. But somebody's asking here that since the murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, et cetera, uh, intense police brutality, the things that we've seen uh, over the last several years, going back to uh, Oscar Grant, do you feel that art has become a greater source of communication and education? Oh, yeah. I, I think it has a great impact. Yeah. I mean, because the quality of it and, uh, and the relationship to reflecting the, those issues of, of on, on, on the uh, community art, street art, very powerful, very strong. You know, you can't get away from the reality of what is taking place. And particularly when this is when it's in, in, in unison with the, uh, with the, uh, the demonstrations, the protests, uh, and all the media, all that, you know, it's no, it shows, it's trying, you know, with the electronic media and the digital age, it's just beyond just boundaries of the United States. It's a universal kind of, uh, uh, of caption of the imagination that people see in the context when you see the, uh, uh, the art that reflects and, and, and keeps the visual attention on those, just those issues of injustice of the murders of, and injustice against uh, people, black people in particular color in particular. Okay. Uh, we got two or three more questions then we're gonna, we're gonna let you go. W one question from me, uh, let me put two of them together here. Uh, one question, obviously, you talked about Homeland Security uh, and you talked about COINTELPRO. So I want you to be clear about how COINTELPRO, which you talked about in relation to Fred Hampton, uh, is still is still here. But the other question was kind of a personal question, Emory, and that was, how do you sustain yourself? How do you keep yourself spiritually strong and mentally strong, uh, the work that you've been doing? You've been in the trenches for a long time. So the COINTELPRO, and then how does Emory take care of himself as an activist? Well, I, I try to eat properly as much as soon as I can. I work, I take a lot of uh, supplements, that are necessary to sustain a healthy, a healthy lifestyle, uh, and uh, list of those as well. And uh, and I I have over many years I did meditation for many years, so I can pull on that in many forms that I, I practice during the time. Yeah, and so all that plays into uh, uh, how I how I manage to make try to maintain myself. In, in that context. Yeah. Okay. And the COINTELPRO and Homeland Security. Fred Hampton obviously is 1969, but as I've seen you in other presentations, COINTELPRO, Homeland, it hasn't changed. And how should people be looking at it these days, Emory? Well, that makes you look at it like you know, you'd be always aware that it's something that exists, exists. I mean, you get in the comfort zone and don't think that uh, it, it's, it's, it, it's something of the past. You know, and you just have to be diligent, and you have to be be aware of focused that it does exist, because all you got to do is look at what you're trying to how they're trying to label Black Lives Matter as a terrorist organization. You know, so that's going to tell pool right there. That's the counterintelligence aspect of whether you agree or disagree with with what it is and how we may do it. That's the context of what they that's COINTELPRO. Yeah. People are talking more and more about equity and diversity. And somebody's asking this question, Emory, in terms of what's the biggest challenge that you've been facing or that you see those of us who stand for human rights facing in terms of how we want to change things, 
so that the next generation is not in the same position that we are? What, what's some of the biggest challenges we have to overcome? How do we develop more unity? Well, more unity, I think, is, is, uh, is that we have to be one in spirit, spirit with, to be inspired by young people and why they do things. Uh, you can't, uh, I, for myself, I, can't, I, can't, I never go in trying to tell them that this is the way you got to do it. If they ask me, I'll share that. But I, if, but I try to listen and to be in harmony with how they want to do things. And if they want me to be inclusive and part of it, then I can give my suggestions and ideals on how that can be included or what have you. But uh, it's a challenge. It's an ongoing process. It's a it's a development because you know, and, and we live in a whole other di di uh, uh, age and stage in how young people think today. You know what I mean? I mean, they come out the womb dealing with the technology. You know, we didn't have that kind of technology that you have today, back then. You know, we didn't have the, we didn't have the, uh, the, uh, the kind of personality, young personalities, our age and stuff, marketing, being marketing to by, you know, by the, and, and in some cases using to manipulate and keep you away from real social justice. In, in, in some ace cases, you could say, when, they, when they're marketing the bling bling and all the other stuff, you know, uh, in the material aspect of things you could say in that context. So it got to be mindful of that, mindful of what it is. It's not, oh, it's okay. The love of bling bling is not, but understanding that, you know, that's, that's, that comes and goes, you know. But you, you want, if you're genuinely con concerned about the uh, social justice, you know, you got to, you got, this is a, it's just a job. It's a job for, it's, you know, it's something that you live to do day in and day out. Like we did, it was on the job training, you know? And, and we, and this continues to be, for these youngsters, it's on the job training. That's as long as they go, but we have to be there to support it directly or indirectly in some kind of way, you know? Uh, mindful of, of the, 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 uh, all maybe the many of the pains and the sufferings and that they are confronted with in relationship to quality of life issues themselves as young people. Um, the fact that uh, a lot of them not thinking that they're going to live to be up to 30 years of age, you know, you got a whole lot of kinds of dynamics going on and, and you know, uh, that we're dealing with, and on top of the wholesome aspect that it, that exists, you know, you know, but it's 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 going to be a ch it's a challenge. We can do it in the context of uh, I guess you have to lead you have to get how you set an example. You have to be set the example, and have to be an example that everybody that is impacted by or look at and can admire. And can see that they want to be a, a part of it or contribute to it. So it has to be something that young people can that do that will inspire other folk, young folks to be in, in part of. I mean, when we started off, people were saying we were crazy. And <laughs> let very few limited. But after we get they seen what we were doing, they was on the fry line and say, yeah, right on, but they wasn't, but after they seen. What was going on? They became more, more supportive. So you lead by example. They, they seen that was by principle, it was based on principle, based on ten point program, and all those things, you know. Okay. But you know, you got then you they have to, then going back to the other question. You got to understand when you when you have a having an impact, and it's going against the grain of 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 the norms of what is so-called norm, that's when the coin tail broke. To discredit and destroy it by any means necessary. That's why the free breakfast program was called public enemy number one, because it was had an impact. It was pointing out the contradictions and what the government should have been doing and wasn't doing. Same thing with the 
free health clinics, all those things that they would call anything but a capitalist program is subversive because it was based on cooperation. It was based on collective coming together, not for the purpose of exploitation, but for uh, 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 the purpose of healing, bringing people together, all those things. Emory, in our last question before we do thank yous here, name some historical people who have inspired you or who inspire you or people right now who inspire you. Well, I was in spirit with, uh, I, I, I think I was almost inspired by, because I, I got involved, I, you know, I was out there just like a lot of these young people. I wasn't a scholar or intellectual, I just want to change something. So I would say that I would, if I was inspired by the, the movement once I got in and became aware of things like Stoker Carmichael, Eight Red Brown in the beginning, you know, and what have you. That was the fighting spirit that I seen then was what, and the Black Arts Movement, talking about the cultural identity and hanging out with Ben and Mary Baraka called Leroy Jones then. Him introduced me to uh, a lot of different folks. That's how I got in touch with Ram, Revolutionary Action Movement, because he was involved with Ram, Revolutionary Action Movement. Well, he, and he introduced me to them, you know, what have you. Okay. So that's, I mean, it's, 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 the, it's the, my inspiration has always been, and when you, if you want to talk about art things that inspired me as a youngster, my auntie used to get this, calendar each year with this black art on it. Mm. And I used to go to stay with a house, but I didn't know who it was. But I admired it because I was I was just in awe because with black art, you know, my mom was legally blind, so she couldn't see nothing. You know, and, and so and she didn't have a lot of, we didn't have a lot of art and stuff at the house. She was proud of me being trying to learn how to paint. And she always talked about it, but we didn't have that kind of art at the house. My auntie then she had calories. I used to stay there all the time. I couldn't find out that was Charles White. So that was an a, a early inspiration for me. And, and it was Charles White uh, in relationship to the, uh, seeing black art and becoming conscious of art. But then in the movement, it was the, uh, it was because both of the stuff that I did had dealt with social justice, uh, even, in, even in the black arts movement. I was beginning to do that. I was doing characters of Stokely, rap, and my, all those things, and, and the, then I did the sister with the uh, with with the gun and the brother with the gun, black studies, those things. And, and but I just when I'm getting into Black Panther Party, I'm getting to see these posters from Cuba. I spawn posters and and they send them to us in the mail. I'm seeing this work from Vietnam. And the Vietnam struggle resistance, all that, Palestine, all that. I'm seeing all that is what was the inspiration for the uh, kind of art that I was did while I was in the Black Panther Party and evolved to this point. Okay. Now today, how I, the color wise with the artwork, as you may see it, is when I was traveling, when I was traveling to different parts of New Zealand and Australia and uh, you'd be riding and you see all these amazing murals back then that these uh, 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 artists were doing, young artists. And I was impacted. It was the graffiti art then that you you could see that it had some message, but he had couldn't know how to decode it except for them youngsters. But it was so impactful in the color of it that it attracted you, and that inspired me to do continue to give more color into the work that I do. Emory Douglas, uh, you are a, a treasure and we thank you so much for being with us. Stay with us for a minute here, but we do want to thank the communications department, the arts and architecture department, the IT department at College of Marin, Katrina King, who is our regional Emoja coordinator who supports us, uh, Dean Tanya Hirsch, the Emoja Learning Community, the Emoja Equity Institute, Nicole Cruz, uh, Professor Barbara uh, Gloystein, uh, the IT department, um, Dr. Colleen Myhall, uh, Dr. Uh, Kevin Muller, 
all of the people who have made this uh, possible. And we will see you again. If people contact us, we'll give them a way to be in touch with you. Uh, but we want to thank all the attendees. Uh, very, very historic uh, and very, uh, very special. So Emory, thank you so much for your craft. Uh, and as I say, we'll see, we'll see you again. We might need to get you on the faculty over here. We might find a way to get you on the faculty over here. Take good care, my brother. Okay. Okay. Peace. Peace. Take care. All right.